Welcome to Gaze in Space. I'm Alex Myers, and I'm here with Simon Pratt. Hello. Today we're going to boldly go where no one has gone before. That's right, we're doing Star Trek The Next Generation, and we're asking whether or not Lieutenant Data is queer. Simon, are you ready for the countdown? Make it so. Simon, before we jump too much into the topic, can you tell our listeners a little bit about you? Sure. So I'm a PhD student finishing up my um, my uh, PhD studying counterterrorism and U.S. the U.S. security apparatus. So this is a very sort of uh, sober topic, but in my spare time, I really, really like science fiction. Uh, it seems like, as a child, my two favorite things to watch were James Bond and Star Trek The Next Generation, and I seem to have not really left that state of mind, so Explosions and, and Picard are pretty much what I went for. So you're Picard over Kirk. Yes, yes. Uh, Next Generation is, is the is the superior series in, in terms of plot and production. Uh, that doesn't mean that it was as groundbreaking as the original Star Trek. Uh, I think I was data for several Halloweens, so I feel <laughs> an especially great kinship with the the, the humanoid robot character, uh, uh, which will certainly amuse people who know me, and my level of um, emotional affect and expression. Um, and more recently, uh, initially I wasn't that big of a fan of Star Trek DS9, but now that I have a few years of um, studying religion and, and conflict, uh, and political philosophy under my belt, I've, I've now found that DS9 is actually an amazing, amazing show and should be sort of dialectically paired with TNG. So I, I, I continue to be really into Star Trek, and I always have been. I suppose for our generations more, are you a Janeway or Picard, but do you think you might be a Cisco? No. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Cisco is a particularly charismatic individual, and that's okay. That's kind of part of who he is. Um, it's all about Major Kira for me. Oh, as we say, maybe we'll have to have you back and talk about um, Garrick and Bashir. So G- Garrick and Bashir is a wond- wonderful pair, especially for somebody who studies uh, intelligence uh, stuff. Uh, but no, I-, I think DS9 is just basically all about Major Kira. <laughs> so let's start with a quick Star Trek 101 before we get into too many specifics. Spoiler warning. Although an extra double warning, this episode is going to push the nerd level up a few notches. Yeah, so so Star Trek The Next Generation, or TNG for short, is about the crew of the uh, USS Enterprise, designation NCC 1701D, as they explore uncharted regions of the galaxy, manage relationships with alien species, imagine new technology, new ways of living, and explore what it means to be human, or, or, or not human, sort of there's, there's some expansion of the category of humanity here. Yeah, human, and maybe the other, which we might talk about a little through yes. today. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the key characters that the show uses to explore our common humanity or inhumanity is Lieutenant Commander Data. Um, for those of you who don't know, he's the first android to serve in Starfleet as an officer. Um, he's also the first entirely artificial sentient creatures, at least one of them, created by a person in the Federation. And he suffers from, I think, what we call a, a fairly severe Pinocchio syndrome. He wants very badly to be human, even though he lacks human emotion. Yeah, so Star Trek um, in these various series uh, has been has been generally progressive, uh, particularly the original Star Trek, uh, tackling issues like race, gender, and class. But it it hasn't really addressed queer themes. Uh, there there's been a sort of notable absence of uh, exploration of queerness and, and same sex. Um, romance and same-sex sexuality throughout. There's actually a sad story. Uh, shortly before his death, uh, the creator and visionary behind Star Trek, uh, Gene Roddenberry, actually created an episode dealing with the AIDS crisis and had plans to have a major character with a same-sex partner. It's unclear whether he's going to add someone to the cast or have someone... Is it coming out when you're just like, hey, here's my partner and they're a same-sex person? But I think that's what he intended to do. Uh, unfortunately, after he died, it was an interview like, I think, a couple of weeks or months before his death, which was a surprise. Um, after he died, the executives permanently shelved the episode, and it took, I guess, 20 more years till Sulu was revealed to have a boyfriend, I believe, in the most recent 
Star Trek movie into I don't Star really Trek treat the reboots as canonical. I mean, I I, can't, I, had to, I struggle to imagine coming out in in Star Trek because it sort of wouldn't be a production. It would just be sort of like oh, uh, yet another kind of character trait. Um, but yes, that is kind of a sad story. Yeah, and um, you know it's kind of sad because you know he was asked does he regret it, and he said kind of yes. He actually had issues himself coming to terms with homosexuality, but he said that he had come to terms with it, and there was actually an episode written. Which seems a little disrespectful of the man's legacy, but um, yeah, let's move on to brighter topics. Yeah. Are androids gay? Data is clearly, well, um, so Data Data seems to have a gender. Um, people keep using the male pronouns with him, masculine pronouns, and uh, he seems he seems comfortable with that. That's a pretty good indication that Data has a gender. It's... Uh, harder to give Data a sex, and it's also conceivable that Data would have no trouble with... Um, uh, Just uh, to clarify, maybe we should take a step back um, and talk about what you mean by gender and sex, because people have different definitions. Like, sex, you're talking about either their biological sex, whether they have a penis or vagina uh, okay, uh, their chromosomes sure let's let, so yeah okay so let's back up very far it's good to say we jumped a little ahead so so i don't think the question is data gay is a very helpful one here but when we talk about gender uh we're talking about um sort of culturally constructed and culturally practiced uh ways of identifying and expressing expressing um oneself uh sexually in terms of one's uh, role in a household. G- I mean, gender touches many different dimensions of uh, social life, and so when we talk about gender, we uh, we look at things like uh, pronoun usage, or whether somebody handles labor that is coded as, say, woman's labor. Or whether someone, whether there are uh, honor codes or obligations that we might call especially manly. How how different emotional roles are assigned. So, so is there is there a say the role of nurturer is that assigned to uh, a particular gender? And I think uh, we can also talk about uh, what what critical theorists refer to as reification, the process by which things that uh, that we we understand to be culturally constructed are given a naturalness and or an inevitability. Mm-hmm. And I think that opens one of the basic questions, like. If we go back to, I guess, the second episode of Star Trek, The Naked Truth, um, this is the one where, again, spoilers, Data has sex with one of his crewmates, Lieutenant uh, Yar, Otasha Yar, um, and it's revealed that he is, quote-unquote, fully functional is how he describes it, and, and programmed with um, many techniques to please. Right. So, I mean, this is why... Uh, so this. So this gets to the earlier difference that I, I alluded to between gender and sex. So normally when we talk about sex, we mean uh, biological or physiological characteristics that, uh, that establish an organism uh, uh, as, uh, you know, as an inseminator versus a birther uh, that, that, that places them in a sort of relatively immutable category. And th- that we see as sort of naturally given as something that isn't the result of cultural learning, but the result of uh, genetic expression uh, or epigenetic expression or something. I mean, sex is a it's it's a fuzzy category, and as queer theorists have pointed out, there are many cases in which we might have somebody who say chromosomally X Y, but mm. has a female appearing body, or even somebody who is chromosomally female, but due to genetic uh, abnormalities ends up with a male-looking body. Yeah, uh, there's XXY chromosome yeah. people. Um, there's a mix. So this is why I say it's hard to to really give data a sex. He seems he yeah he seems comfortable with masculine pronouns, uh, and but and, and you know but just because he has a penis, uh, we assume, and just because his 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 body frame looks like that of an adult uh, male doesn't necessarily mean that he is male. Uh, what do we? What does it mean to call male or female something that did not, did not develop out of an embryo uh, that was not sort of genetically shaped that doesn't is sort of constructed as an adult organism? 
I, I do think that there's a lot packed into the naked now and the idea of uh, of his relationship with Yar because it's, it's it's true that this relationship is important to him. Yeah, and but could Yar have been male and a man, and would that still have happened? Do you think? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we should jump back a little bit. I think the whole situation's a little weird in how it creates the attraction. Um, the whole crew in that Naked Nails under the influence of an intoxicant, which acts like alcohol. Not the whole of the crew, but the majority of the crew. And it's interesting, Yar is what one might think of as a masculine figure. She's the security chief. She has a, a short haircut. And if you even watch the episode, it kind of seems like she's soliciting Deanna Troy first. Um, she goes to Deanna's... Yar's kind of butch. Yar is kind of bush, and he goes into Deanna's quarters and, like, has her clothes up, and Odin's like, should I try on this dress or that dress? And then Deanna's like, I'm feeling mixed emotions from you, which I'm like, are those conflicted fears about the sexuality? And Yar kind of holds her hand, like, intimately. And then, like, when Deanna's not infected with this intoxicant, she, like, kind of backs up, and then Yar's like oh, I'll find someone else. And next scene, like, Data walks in on her, and she's like, are you, like, do you have a dildo built in? Right. So, so I mean, so, yeah, yeah. so Yar's, Yar's uh, sexuality and gender looks kind of queer. Yeah. Uh, Potentially. It, it, but, I don't want to label her. Um, well, the, the mere fact that we can have this conversation um, about a character shows that there's a queerness to it. She may not identify as queer, as mm-hmm. you know, canonically, but it means that we're able to talk about um, deviations from a sort of standard heterosexual womanly look and expression. With, with Data, we have no reason to think that there's a kind of physiological or genetically inherited disposition toward um, sex with one um, sex or the other. Uh, or you know, so that so, being said. Yeah. We'll talk about it later, but I think an argument might be made that there might be some built-in... Maybe. Um, uh, which would which would change the way that we're talking about uh, queerness and data. But assuming that that this isn't, that it's not certainly not explicit, and it might not even be all that implicit, it seems to me as though data could more or less just choose. I think he could. I think the fact that um, Dr. Noonien Soon, who is his creator was very much a, we assume, heterosexual male. Of all his relationship partners, they were male. And he very deliberately gave Data and Data's twin brother, Lore, and their other twin before, if you count the movies as canon. Um, They all have the same face that is his. So I think there might be an argument that he might have programmed it in, but it doesn't seem like Data has chosen a sexual orientation by himself. It seems like both his gender... And his... What I'm saying is I don't know if he has a sexual orientation. Because you don't know if he has a sexual attraction to anyone. Uh, or, or if he did, it isn't clear to me that there would be anything other than incidental reasons why this attraction would be directed at uh, female or woman presenting mm-hmm. um, persons. And it's interesting, Yar was very much the aggressor on this. She kind of asked if he was uh, fully functional and then threw him down on the bed. I mean, let's be honest, like... Like, lots of, uh, I mean, Data is also a sort of, um, uh, I would say, sort of partial blank blank slate insert that, uh, you know, for a whole bunch of nerdy fanboys to empathize with. And uh, nerdy fanboys may, may want a sort of more aggressive uh, woman to, uh, uh, you know, um, introduce them to, to sex or something. I don't know. I mean, I did. Like, uh, maybe so not I, a, a nerdy, maybe not a strong woman. I mean, I mean... W- when I was attracted to women more, I was more attracted to like sort of stronger uh, uh, women. So I don't think it's helpful to focus on whether uh, Lieutenant Yar was a uh, sort of sexy aggressive person or, or or how you know so much as whether there's anything in particular about her her womanhood or femaleness that was somehow necessary to the role she played for Data and the fact that they, they both hooked up. And this is why I, I say, like, it's not really explicitly discussed, but, like, implicitly it seems like Data should be pansexual or omnisexual. It doesn't seem to me as though uh, gender or even humanness versus being a member of another species uh, should actually make much of a difference for Data if he wants to... 
uh, have sex or be sexual because it seems as though this is something that um, there's no particular reason to believe why it would. There's none of the cultural or uh, physiological or genetic reasons that we would normally have to think that somebody has a sexuality that is fixated on a certain gender or a certain sex. That being said, I think there's an interesting line, sorry if this is getting too much of a close reading, right before Yar, I assume, like, has sex with Data, she calls him a jewel, which is, is very much a feminine object, traditionally, culturally. It's, again, an object, and I think there's this interesting facet throughout the series of Data being put into this questionable position that I think is traditionally more female, or at least traditionally that of the other, you know, African Americans as property when they're in North American culture, you have the black people to the people who bought them were treated as the others if they weren't. People, women have historically been treated as property and put into these objective positions. Like cinematically, like if we're looking at like film theory, you know, you identify with the male protagonist and you desire the female. So I see what you're saying. Uh, so certainly if we want to do a close reading of The Naked Now, uh, like it, it, it would be fun to look at that one, one remark, that that one apparent objectification, and being objectified as a pretty thing, a jewel, uh, and say, oh, you know, in fact, maybe this is lesbian sex. Maybe, maybe like Data is actually a woman. Uh, no, I actually think maybe it's you are masturbating. Would maybe, be my argument more. That, that would be also a really interesting <laughs> read. Uh, but it also gets me to uh, and and the, your comment on objectification makes me think of uh, Bruce Maddox in The Measure of a Man. So much is made about how Maddox shifts at the very end, perhaps not intentionally, uh, in calling Data, from calling Data it to calling him he. There's another reason why I think Data is, 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 is man, is a man, right? There's sort of uh, much is made over Maddox's shift from, from uh, sort of shifting Data from object to subject and then specifically masculine subject. So yeah, I think I think whether data is an object, how data is objectified, is a recurrent theme, and this is where you might get a little bit more abstract in what we think of queer theory as being about or queer theory is doing. Uh, you know, in that we're not just necessarily fixated on the specifics of gender and sexuality. We're looking at uh, the boundaries of humanity, the boundaries of subject positions, by which I mean whether whether we're willing to admit something into the category of feeling rights bearing, potentially uh, uh, sort of sensate uh, sensate organisms that that could ha that could you know sort of like calling data he rather than an it establishes him as the sort of thing that might have a sexuality to begin with, that might have a sex or a gender, that, you know, as opposed to saying, well, the very possibility of imagining that data has sex or gender is just, is just nonsensical. Whereas, you know, sort of if we call data an it, if we treat data as a pretty object, then it makes no sense to ask it, these questions of him. It is, but I mean, I think there's also the assumption that this turn of going from it to he is empowering in a way, but I also think there's something interesting that what if could data not be a living sentient being that owed rights and still be an it? I mean, obviously part of it is acknowledging data's self identification, you know, but I do worry that, you know, what about someone or some alien creature or what about a transgender person who doesn't or a gender queer person who doesn't identify as he or she who has some sort of intersex I mean, identity? I, was... I know you're not implying that they should. No, I mean I'm, I'm saying let's look at what what uh, what it versus he is doing for Maddox in that scene, rather than could we conceivably have somebody who is a a, a subject that prefers the pronoun it? Uh, like in the specific scene, the significance of this scene is that Maddox has just included data in the community of of sentient. Um, uh, human-like things or has he accepted um data into what's that song was on broadway uh the brotherhood of men you know welcome guy from harry potter was in it it's... i think he'd better give us a short performance there is a brotherhood of man a benevolent brotherhood of man 
noble tide it binds all human hearts and minds into one brotherhood of man. So that was Daniel Radcliffe in How to Succeed in Business Without Even Trying. Anyway, back to Star Trek and Data. I think my reading of your gem might be perhaps giving Star Trek creators maybe a little too much credit, assuming they, they crafted each word perfectly. I mean, texts uh, have a life beyond their authors. Mm-hmm. Uh, n- not not a fully independent life. I'm not going to go that far. Uh, but uh, I think that if we can have this kind of discussion, then it's because the text allows for it. And I don't think this is too much of a stretch. Yeah. And the Brotherhood of Men thing, I think, isn't such a stretch because I think it does it does reveal something that I think... I think a lot of times Data's fitting in or not fitting into masculinity is part of his queerness. How does he relate to it? Um, well, he, I mean, Data is fairly gentle. And he, he's portrayed as a sort of a gentle soul. And it's very difficult to associate many of the specific uh, uh, signals or symbols or tropes of manfulness to Data uh data is artsy he uh, he he's very fond of his uh his cat uh he mm-hmm. isn't a, a womanizer like riker he isn't particularly commanding and authoritative like picard he isn't menacing or or especially martially combative like Worf is uh, uh so he, he it, this is doesn't necessarily suggest to me that data is trans femme we, I mean, that's an interesting conversation to have. It's more like Data is a child. And this is sort of repeatedly, in fact, explicitly said, I, I feel like, on numerous occasions. So cool. the idea that children don't really have sexualities or that the genders of children are less uh, thickly constituted and expressed may be relevant here. It's interesting that you bring up the fact that Data was a child, because if we jump back to uh, The Skin of Evil, which was an episode where Lieutenant Yar... So where Yar dies, yeah. Yeah, it's where Yar dies. Um, I guess, spoiler, I think that's kind of one of the defining things of her characters. It's kind of like um, Uncle Ben in Spider-Man or Jean Grey, spoiler, spoiler, I've just ruined. Yet another example of the lesbian character getting knocked off. <laughs> um, like Stranger Things. But Yar, it's interesting how Yar positions herself to data after the relationship Right in that episode, she goes to Data like, this never happens, and tells him pretty much never to mention it again. And then when she dies, Data's message isn't the first one or the last one. It's somewhere in the middle, and she's like, you're a great friend. You're like a child. You bring the innocence of children to everything you do. Which I think, in a way, again, back to uh, Measure of a Man, one of the things Picard does to try and humanize data and get him into maybe this club of men or humanity depending on how you see it is show like here's a picture of yar you had sex with yar you liked yar right this makes you more relatable to us as human beings and data has this weird relationship with this memory of a person who died where he fetishized the experience in a way that i don't think she would be entirely comfortable with that might be a bit unfair to um, to data, uh, oh, it's but very I think, unfair. I think that that if I recall, the argument that Picard makes in Measure of a Man is that Data isn't human. He is a he is the sole member of a fully new alien species, and this is again why why I think there might be more abstract uh, uh, questions that we might ask uh, as you know in thinking about queerness and Data questions of transhumanism questions of uh, boundaries of affect and sentience that that get a little bit sort of complex with the way that Measure of a Man played out, because it really does seem as though this is a show... I mean, of course, Star Trek Next Generation in particular is just all about like allegories to human, human uh, political... Uh, circumstances, both historically and contemporarily. Mm-hmm. So this really, is, you know, this is this is really just a trial about whether whether black people should be treated as equal. You know, the, I mean, that really does kind of feel what it's what it's about, and this gets pretty explicit when Guinan talks about slavery. But it very much feels like Picard is arguing that data should be treated as human, and yet the substance of his ar- arguments are that he is not human. 
Uh, so on the one hand, yes, as I should data be accepted into the brotherhood of men. On the other hand, the argument is data is we we acknowledge that data is not a human being. He isn't part of that brotherhood of men. Uh, but except that perhaps the all of the practical consequences of something being human should be extended to plenty of inhuman things or non-human things. You know the episode Quality of Life with the exocomps? Uh, they're little artificial intelligence. There's three, and Data's the one who recognizes them. I can't remember that. Um, in it's any case, very long time that's I watched it all. not the scene I'm going to refer to. It's interesting, the opening scene of that... There's a card game where Riker, LaForge, Worf, and Dr. Crusher are playing poker, as they often do in the intros to these episodes. And they're talking about beards, because LaForge has started to grow a beard, and at this point, Riker is fully bearded, and Worf, of course, has facial hair because it's part of his identity. And actually, um, Beverly calls Jordy out on that. What is it? Like they say, um, you know, beards are like a sign of manliness, their courage, their strength, they're all this. Many great men throughout history have had beards. And she's like, after the razor blade, you know, was created, this is really just like makeup. You know, it's just, um, it's just an item of affectation. She actually uses the word affectation. Um, and they're like, all like, no, this is great. And in the end, they make a wager, which we never see the end to um, where they'll shave or she'll dye her hair brown. And they're like comparing this. Um, but also what Beverly calls them out on is she's like, and it doesn't hurt that women can't grow beards either. So there is this idea of affectation and belonging. And I think it's interesting when we look at data because he naturally doesn't grow a beard either. And he's interesting when he does, there's actually an episode, I think in the second season uh, where he grows a beard and everyone on the ship like makes fun of him. I think it was actually a bit of an inside joke. Well, not such an inside joke. I think they were also kind of making fun of Jonathan Franks, who'd grown a beard as Riker character. And, uh, you know, Data, there's lots of memes. Data likes to stroke his beard. So, I mean, th there's a question that I've been considering, which does have uh, something to do with the sorts of affectations that characters may take on and the sorts of uh, performances of identity, particularly gender performances of identity, that we, you know, we see in Data versus other characters. And this is the kind of question where we, we, where we ask, like, could Data be trans? Because I feel like if we're going to talk about uh, queerness, then we also need to talk about... Um, sorry, let me back up. The, the reason why I'm thinking about this is because if we don't think it's possible for Data to be trans then Data is queer in a very different sort of way than uh, we think of, say, uh, one of my trans friends as being queer, right? Because um, there's a certain experience of being trans, of feeling dysmorphia, of um, completely reorganizing and reorienting one's um, performances and practices and expressions of gender to, to shift, across uh, ascribed boundaries. If Data can't be trans, then his space to be queer, I think, is, is much smaller than we might think. So what do you think? I've got a bit of an interesting view of Data's sexuality. I'll mention it now, but I think we'll build to it if that's okay. I see Data as, as belonging not to humanity. So the whole idea of, if you're talking about transgender... I think he maybe does perform masculinity, or, or at least he tries to. Whether he perfectly fits into that male or manly, womanly, feminine, masculine divide, I think it's an interesting question. He's often, again, put into that, you know, objectified position that you'd expect from a feminine person. What like, I mean is, like, what does it feel like to be data and to be given a gender and be given a sort of very loose species category that might not be uh, uh, natural or native or inherited or even necessarily learned in the way that it is for uh, flesh and blood human beings. Mm -hmm. So now I think is a good time to jump to the offspring because in The Measure of a Man, one of the big arguments is Data is belonging to his own species and it's a species of one right now. In The Offspring, Data 
creates himself a daughter. Well, he creates himself a child. It's interesting that the child doesn't start off as a man or a woman. The child chooses his body. Yeah, it chooses her body ultimately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and her species. So Data allows his child to have a choice. And I think part of what he's doing is he wants to give her a choice. I don't remember if he says it explicitly, but it's implied that he wants to be a parent. He wants to be a better parent than his father was. And in doing so, um, he wants to give his offspring Lol, which is kind of an ironic name. I don't think Lol cats and Lol everything existed back then. Um, back in the 90s. Or might have been in the 80s even. In any case, I think it's interesting that um, he gives his offspring this choice that was never given to him. So I wonder... Where does the choice come from? He creates this person as an agender mechanical no, I, being? I mean, um, I... So I'm, I mean, I, I'm hesitant to commit really strongly to any definition of what it means to be trans because I'm, I, I'm not... I don't think that... I've ever had the experience of being trans. And I also think that trans is a, a, a sort of a plastic category. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, pla- I, I self-consciously use the term plastic here rather than fluid. Uh, I mean, it, it, there are some, there's some, some stability to how we use it, but it's also, it can be shifted and moved around. But I think uh, it's very difficult not to talk about the, well, you know, the internal sensory life of data uh, and how comfortable he is uh, being treated as a human, sort of by default by many people, how comfortable he is being treated as a man. And we can ask about the internal life of his offspring. Because Data, in a measure of a man, says that he, he, uh, that he experiences um, the qualia of, of the world, that there is a sort of a, a, a flavor of experience that he is aware of that would be lost if his memory was just copied to a large computer. Mm-hmm. And um, because I think that part of what it means to be trans has a lot to do with experiencing one's body in in ways that are not synchronized with the ascri- ascribed identities uh, and expressions um, that that people are sort of expected to have, are, you know sort of are transposed on you and that you're expected to conform to and reproduce. Well, it's interesting, like. Troy before when she's talking to Lal about this choice Data and Lal both say like this is such an important choice it's going to affect like how you perceive yourself and how others perceive you and I also wondered can Jade can Data change his sex like can he just alter his body or once because it seemed like gendering Lal I don't understand why that was a permanent process why can't they just regender themselves or is it I would say that this is where we start to run up against the uh, the limits of the show's creators. I mean, part of what makes science fiction really special is that you're able to, uh, through uh, through the narrative devices of future and advanced technology, um, sort of significantly reimagine uh, the kind of universe that, that that we can live in. That you're allowed to explore radically different possibilities of social organization or uh, human uh, constitution. And I think that this might just be a case in which the show's creators and authors, uh, it just didn't occur to them that that gender and sex, uh, A, might not align, and B, could be impermanent. It's true. It's interesting in that episode, a little behind-the-scenes factoid, um, there's a scene where Lal's like, what is love? And in the script, um, Guinan's supposed to say, love is what happens when a man and a woman really like each other. And she refused to say that line. She it's because Whoopi them... Goldberg is like a magnificent human being uh, worthy of all of our love. Yeah, and she made them switch to gender neutral roles. And she even tried to insist that they use like a same-sex couple in the background when she's describing it. Um, However... producers stop them. I mean, I would say that um, when TNG is, is being created, uh, the idea of um, same-sex romance or same-sex love or, same, or, or of, of homosexuality uh, had greater was sort of more prominent in the social imaginary than um, than being trans. And so again, 
I mean, so we're already already you're telling me that the show's writers were not particularly good uh, <laughs> allies, uh, and 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 you know it was, it's great that uh, Whoopi Goldberg like refused to mm-hmm. to accept this, but it may also just we, we may have to contextualize the dialogue and the the show in its in the cultural context of its production rather than in the context of the sort of world that it purports or tries to represent. Mm-hmm. And just clarify, I think the writers, it was an omission. I think it was the producers who were uncomfortable showing this. Um, and we also talked about in the past, like, Star Trek is a show that's very gender aware. Um, in the first season of TNG, there were, um, Gene Roddenberry's opinion was, in essence, dresses in a lot of the gender superfluous elements to masculinity and femininity were just affectations in the future we wouldn't really divide people up the same way so then why doesn't diana wear like a normal person uniform instead of a form-fitting bodysuit um well because she identifies that way what's interesting the first season of tng is they had a bunch of men in short skirts and they were big muscle men um they're called kilts and they were worn by the greeks and romans at these war. were one piece it wasn't just like a, a dress on the bottom is like it was pretty much what uhura wore in um the original star trek like the little they weren't wearing heels but that's because they probably just couldn't uh find a pair that fit i mean who... they also had earrings like they they were dressed how we would identify feminine they never got like a speaking role and they were removed after the first season because the producers thought it was uh quote unquote distracting to have these people in the background that's interesting. I didn't actually know that, or indeed pick up on that. Uh, of course, the last time I, I, I really like watched the first season of Star Trek: Next Generation, I was an unenlightened little shit. So, <laughs> uh, so it's very possible that this just, just like completely went past me. Yeah, it's interesting because I didn't even notice it either. This was brought up to me, and then afterwards, I'm like, oh yeah, and I've seen screenshots, and like if you watch the early episodes, being aware of it. But it's interesting that people were like so distracted that they like had to get rid of them. But most people who I know who are queer and looking for that type of representation, didn't even notice it. So to bring this back to data... <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. The, so th- this, this raises for me the question of um, how much of data's apparent comfort identifying in ways that strike us as cis and heteromasculine, how much of that is uh, something we can... We can sort of diminish in salience because we think oh it was just an omission it was just overlooked and how much this is a very deliberate attempt by writers to give him a personality because i don't want to do violence to the characters that uh, of the universe that we're seeing because we are at the moment kind of treating them as having a certain life and a certain distinctiveness as well as being texts that we can analyze on the other hand i feel like if it was just if if some of these um, if some of these flavors of data are unintentional uh, and perhaps not even consistent with the kind of universe we ultimately think the writers wanted to make and that Gene Roddenberry wanted to make, I'm more comfortable uh, reimagining things a little bit more. Mm. I think, on one hand, people can want to be more open-minded. I think actually being open-minded and more progressive sometimes... Sometimes imagining a better world, there are limitations of imagination, and you end up kind of being affected by the world you're living in. You know, that being said, I have a background in literature and more of the classics. So I sometimes see Data as a woman in that perspective, so much as the classical approach to womanhood is to look at... um, you know, a woman as the mother, the life giver, that which, you know, births life. Hold on. Those qualities are not necessarily biologically no, fixed. The biologically fixed quality is the reproduction. Um, I think he... Why so, can't men reproduce? I mean, data doesn't, data doesn't have a womb. Data doesn't um, birth children in the ways that we associate with females giving birth. Data has male... Uh, primary sex characteristics in an external sense, and he's capable and at, at various points does um, manifest uh, secondary male sex characteristics like facial hair. So so I, th- I think... Um... Well, I think one of the things you mentioned in A Measure of Man is it was argued that Data is actually the first of a new species. Um, he is a species of one at the beginning of the series, to our knowledge. I think it's interesting if we go forward... 
Um, I think one of my favorite characters is a one-off randomly is Data's mother. Um, yes. In episode 710 Inheritance, Data meets this woman who ends up being an android, but has all of the memories of Dr. Soon's So, So I think partner. it's way easier to say that, 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 that Data's mother uh, sort of is, um, is a woman. Is a, and and it, you know, because her her she is not even aware that she is an android. Her experience of herself and her body seems seems basically a, a, a cis uh, female feminine. Um, whereas I think with data, I mean, we might perhaps our comparison here should be something like um, the many species in the world that are capable of changing their sex. Uh, when when it is reproductively important for them to do so. It's funny was Australia actually saw one of the fish they nicknamed Priscilla. Anyways, um, Data, at one point she's talking to Data and she says, like, a lot of your analytic cold ability, that comes from your father. He wanted you to be, like, a scientist like him. But your creativity and your interest in the arts, that came from me. I I made him put some of these things in. I I contributed to this. And I think it's interesting... Data is kind of at this point in a species where, have you ever read Saga? It's a comic book series. Of, I've tried to get you to read it before. Um, one of the lines there is like, the opposite of war is fucking. It's that, you know, war is destruction. So the opposite isn't just peace or like absence of war. It's an act of creation. It's a raw, powerful, creative life, a creative force that creates life. I mean, I'd say for Data, the opposite of war is creation. Because for him, fucking is not a procreative act. For him, it's imagining and creating. It's okay. this artistic but quality. If It isn't clear to me that procreation is necessarily a female, like, like a female sexed act for him. And I think that uh, the fact... I, I think that this is mostly an argument for saying that like data doesn't have sex because data isn't a human being. And this is, this is a good way of looking at the limits of ascribing humanity to data or treating data as human and how the show really flirts with, uh, uh, whether this is a legitimate maneuver. Again, yes. And I, I suppose my point is he's a race of one in so much as his procreation doesn't come from sex in biological but it, I meant in terms of him being a creator of life through this imaginative creative process, through wanting offspring and building them. Like we never see his counterpart, his brother Lore, engage in this. He does. Lore does co-opt uh, at one point uh, a bunch of young Borg who are in a, a state of turmoil, and he does in some way convert them to part of his collective. But he doesn't create life from the rawest form. So I wonder for Data's species, is this creative act of you know giving life, creating law, even though she didn't survive, is that for androids and for the future of humanity perhaps, does creation and life come from this artistic place and does that kind of supplant feminism, femin, femin, feminine, I almost said feminist, <laughs> Does that almost become the feminine of the future? Is there are those who create life through creativity? I think there's the and those this generation who is sort of very full of like sensitive creative men, uh, and it's full of some fairly coldly analytical women. And we might even say this is one of the ways in which it is uh, progressive for its time uh, in its representation of men and women. So I, I, I I'm, I'm skeptical of the interpretation that you're offering right now. And I suppose, like, I think part of it is just the absurdity of applying a term like sex to something that is not biological, that doesn't reproduce the way we do. Um, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure that it's absurd. This is why I say that the show flirts with and and uh, makes complex the category of uh, you know, categories like sex, categories like humanity. And that Data is a really interesting character. And ultimately, I would say the reason why I'm comfortable calling Data queer is because it's very, very difficult to um, assign him or deprive him or deny him uh, a gender or a sex. 
Uh, and I don't know whether this is deliberate on the part of the show's writers to produce this considerable ambiguity, but this appears to be the this appears to to me to be what the outcome of his character uh, is. Mm, and and I agree. Unfortunately, with that, I think we're actually running out of time for today. As a first time guest, would you want to choose a Funko Pop doll? Uh, we've got three random ones here. Mr. Well, obviously, Big from Utopia. Obviously, I will take the Star Wars one. Han Solo from Star Wars. Not Nibbler from Futurama? No. No. Really? Although he does look creepy because he doesn't have, like, pupils. No. Uh, Z- Zootopia is the most unfortunately named um, film that uh, could ever have been released um, with this theme. So I will not have anything, any of its memorabilia in my house. Uh, and, like... Star Wars is a superior media product to to the Futurama, so I think I'll be taking the the Han Solo one. Okay. And so with that, let's wrap things up. I want to thank you all for listening and thank Simon for coming over. Uh, If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave a comment. Are there any queer nerdy topics you'd like us to talk about? Anything we miss? We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, You can reach us at gazeinspace.com, gaze with a Z. At the end, uh, if we get... A thousand subscribers, Simon will take off his shirt for a promo pic. Bullshit. <laughs> and you can check out our profiles and uh, website there. Um, Simon, do you have any social media you'd like to push out there? Yeah, if you're interested in like an unending stream of terrible, terrible news and like the odd, the odd clever meme or cat video, you can find me on Twitter. Um, my Twitter feed is at Simon underscore the underscore Pratt, P-R-A-T-T. And I'm Alex Underdash Myers, M Y E R Z. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, uh, live long and prosper. Now you may join the Elks, my friend, and I may join the Shriners, and other men may carry cards as members of the diners. Still others wear a golden key or small Greek letter pin. But I have learned there's one great club. That all of us are in There is a brotherhood of man A benevolent brotherhood of man A noble tie that binds all human hearts and minds Into one brotherhood of man Your lifelong membership is free Keep forgiving each brother all you can Oh, aren't you proud to be in that fraternity The great big brotherhood of man
coming up. 